So for those of you on social media, we just wanted to let you know that you can follow us, retweet us, and post on social media as well. You can use the hashtag that you see on the screen at the moment for hashtag and child marriage, and you can tag Girls Inspire, the Commonwealth of Learning, and Girls Not Brides. Now, without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to Mrs. Frances Perrero. Um, who is a senior advisor for the women and girls and the team leader for education at the Commonwealth of Women. <clears throat> Thank you, Cherise. Good morning, everybody, uh, wherever you are in Asia and Africa, and also our guest speaker who is in the UK, uh, and then our staff and colleagues here in Vancouver, in Canada. Uh, this is our third webinar in our monthly series of webinars, which is part of our strategy to build the capacity of our partners and members in our community of practice on various issues which are pertinent to our strategy to end child early forced marriage. Uh, as you know, Girls Inspire is a partnership between the Commonwealth of Learning and community organizations in Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Mozambique, and Tanzania. Uh, to address the barriers women and girls face that prevent their full participation in society, particularly the harmful cycle of child early and forced marriage. Thanks to grants from the governments of Australia and Canada, the Commonwealth of Learning will use ODI and technology enhanced learning to support the schooling and skills training of 45,000 girls over the next three years. This webinar was organized to increase our own knowledge on the issue of child early forced marriage and the objectives of this webinar are the next slide to discuss child early forced marriage and to share information on recent international developments that have an impact on CFM. Girls Not Brides is a global partnership of more than 600 civil society organizations from over 80 countries committed to ending child marriage and enabling girls to fulfill their potential. They share Cole's conviction that every girl has the right to lead the life that she chooses and that by ending child marriage, we can achieve a safer, healthier, and more prosperous future for all. I'm very pleased to introduce Heather Hamilton, the Interim Executive Director of Girls Not Brides. Heather is responsible for ensuring that Girls Not Brides delivers on its strategy and advances their collective efforts to end child marriage. Most recently, Heather worked at the UNICEF Asia Pacific Regional Office on the Public Finance for Children Initiative. Previously, she led several coalitions and networks on global issues as Executive Director on the Connect US Fund, a multi-foundation grant-making initiative, and as Executive Vice President and Chief of Staff at Citizens for Global Solutions, she has significant, significant experience in organizational leadership, advocacy, and strategy communications, and has led numerous multi-organizational messaging initiatives on advocacy goals. Heather, I'm pleased to hand over the floor to you. Uh, it's delightful to be with you here today. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time. Um, I have slides, so I'm going to start the presentation. And Oops, sorry. I have to click on show my screen first, I believe. Please bear with me. Uh, I don't, is my screen showing? Not yet, Heather. Okay. Okay. Could we try, could we try sharing it again? I've lost the little, uh, thing that says share my screen when I made the presentation full size. Bear with us, Heather, we're just trying to reshare the screen with you. Okay. Sorry about that. I hit I hit full size before that there it goes. Mm -hmm. Share my screen. And then that full size. Can everybody see it now? It's coming. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, fantastic. Well, 
It is really great to be with you here today. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about child marriage and how it uh, manifests around the world and the impact on girls and a little bit tiny introduction to Girls Not Brides. And then we're going to talk a little bit about our theory of change and how it might, might be useful for your work. And then talk a tiny bit about um, some of the recent developments that have, um, that have come up recently at the international level that can help support national level work. Um, so brief introduction to child marriage. Child marriage um, affects 15 million girls a year. That is 28 girls a minute, one girl every two seconds is married. One, two. That is how frequently it occurs. It affects one out of three girls in the developing world. Um, there are over 700 million women alive today who were married before the age of 18, 10% of the world's population. And while rates of child marriage are decreasing slowly, those rates of decrease are not enough to offset the growth in population. So if we do not increase the pace of change, we're going to see an increase in the sheer number of girls married. And we expect that 1.2 billion girls total will be married as children by 2050. That is the equivalent of the entire population of India. This is a, an issue that happens across countries, cultures, religions, and stable and fragile contexts. It's not just one religion one part of the world. You can see from the stats on the screen that it affects all the regions. But a surprising chart um, is when you look at the countries with the highest absolute number of girls married before the age of 15, what you see is that this really isn't something that is isolated, that is uh, just in Africa or South Asia. It's really a global issue from Mexico to Indonesia, um, so it affects everyone, and that might, that, I think that's something that's surprising to a lot of people. So what is the impact of child marriage? When a girl becomes a bride, the consequences are lifelong and absolutely devastating. She's usually forced to drop out of school and housework, not homework, becomes her priority. She loses all the benefits associated with schooling, which I'm sure you are all very familiar with. But then she's also usually pressured to have children, several and soon, um, by her family at a time when pregnancy and childbirth are really dangerous for her. Girls under 15 are significantly more likely to die in childbirth than women in their early 20s. And these consequences span generations. The children of girls are 60% more likely to die before their first birthday than those that have older mothers. Because they're isolated and without power, Child brides are at a higher risk of HIV and sexual, physical, and psychological violence throughout their life. Child marriage traps girls, their families, and societies in a cycle of poverty. The children of girls married young are likely to marry young and, and, and reinforce this cycle of deprivation and rights violation. And that's really critical. It is a human rights violation. It deprives a girl of her rights to health, education, freedom from violence, and most importantly, the right to choose if, when, and whom to marry. All of these have massive impacts on the individual girl. But as, as the world is increasingly recognized, they make child marriage a major development issue. Child marriage is a barrier to eight of the 16 new global goals for, for sustainable development. Half the goals cannot be achieved without addressing child marriage, including education. So why does this happen? Parents generally want what's to do what's best for their children. They love their daughters. So why do they marry them early? In some places, it's because this is just the way it's always been done. Um, it's just a tradition. Um, there also may be financial transactions involved, such as dowry or bride pay, price, which place a financial value on the life of a girl. The girl may have few other options. There may not be schools in her community to attend, or the schools aren't safe, or there aren't other economic opportunities in her community for her as an alternative to marriage. And in situations of insecurity, some families view marriage as a safe option for girls, not realizing the significant violence that she will face within marriage. But ultimately and critically, we have to remember that Child marriage happens to girls because they are girls. While these are all drivers of child marriage, the underlying cause is gender inequality. This view that a girl has very little value outside of her worth in marriage, her virginity, and her so-called honor. 
So a little bit about Girls Not Brides. In 2011, the elders, um, which you may know as uh, the group of elder states people who have really had a, an impact on um, bringing issues to the attention of the world, they, they wanted to look at this issue um, of the intersection of religion, tradition, and the oppression of women. So Mrs. Michelle um, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu started having conversations about how do we do this, how do we get at this critical intersection. And so the executive director of the elders at that point, who is the chair of our board of trustees, Mabel Von Aranya, started having conversations about this with a lot of people. And she was shocked to learn the scope of child marriage. I think we are all shocked to learn the scope when we first heard about it, that it's not just a, something that happens in a few places or isolated, that it's really this one out of three, 15 million a year. Um, but there was so little awareness across the spectrum from the general public all the way to global leaders of the issue itself and how it affects so many other issues. It was getting very little policy and programmatic attention. There was fantastic work being done, particularly at the community level, but there was no scale visibility and connection to other people making, uh, doing this work, and so that people weren't able to learn what was working. So the elders brought together in 2011 uh, a group of people who were really leading on uh, addressing child marriage in Addis, and they said what needed to be done. And this this sets out sets out the agenda for Girls Not Brides. Um, what we reviewed a little bit earlier: the idea that we need to raise awareness, expand policy commitment and funding, and strengthen learning and co coordination. On a more substantive level, since 2014, we've been working as a partnership on five major strategic objectives. The first is to really get the international community to acknowledge this and set that global norm, to get those intergovernmental institutions to make those commitments. The second is to really learn what is necessary to end child marriage, increasing the evidence base. Thirdly, we wanted to draw attention to those areas where progress was occurring at the country level, those countries that were taking early action on child marriage. The fourth objective was to, to, to increase the amount of funding in the field with an issue that affects so many girls. Um, you cannot address it with scattershot funding. And fifth, we needed, we needed a global movement. We knew that this was an issue that required a movement and partnership. So in 2014, we brought together 150 researchers, external experts, and a lot of members to, to try and get at this question of what will it take to end child marriage. And what we came up with was uh, the Girls Not Brides theory of change. This is a theory of change not just for our uh, secretariat or our partnership, but really a theory of change for the field on what it's going to take to end child marriage. Um, it's informed the work of our members by helping them situate their work within the field to understand how their specific interventions fit into a larger process of change. It's also been adopted by a number of donor countries, the UN Global Program, and others as a way of, of, infl of, of informing their work. At the heart of this theory of change is a, what we call a catalyzing strategy, which is best articulated as a set of guiding principles or overall approach for how we believe change needs to happen. So, we recognize that our work has to be long-term and sustainable. There is no quick fix to ending child marriage, and that we need to be working at all levels. So not just the international level, but at the regional, national, and most importantly, community level. And that these efforts have to be coordinated so that we have maximum impact. And where possible, we need integration across sectors. Um, so we can't just advocate for the Ministry of Gender to address child marriage as child marriage. We need to look at other ministries and other approaches, including education, including health, because this issue can't just be addressed within one sector. Um, and then we also finally look, it stresses the importance that we need to learn and share from each other what are those effective approaches, um, not only at the uh, big, inter uh, big national level, but also very much at the community level as well. So that's where the partnership itself fits in. Looking more broadly at this theory of change, there are seven levels in total from the problem statement through to the vision statement at the top. Um, at the bottom, we start with this problem statement that we have 15 million girls a year married, married each year, and that results in harmful consequences. And then moving up to the top, 
we have a vision that is explicitly about the end state that we want girls to be in, um, that we envision a world without child marriage where girls and women enjoy equal status with boys and men and are able to achieve their full potential. It's very important. It's not just about stopping child marriage, but that end state for the girl. In between, we really look at what it's going to take to um, get to these long-term changes. So the, these, these long-term changes that we want to see is that girls are able to decide if, when, and whom to marry, and that married girls must be able to live an empowered and healthy life. It's important to note that we do really put a focus not just on preventing child marriage, but addressing the needs of those girls that are married. So in between, what we have are those intermediate steps. And I want to draw your attention to the, the level of outcomes, where there are four key outcomes outlined. When we think about child marriage, many people automatically go to that first outcome, laws and policies. Um, that we should just change the law and enforce the law, and that's going to be enough. And while it is certainly important and critical, we know that child marriage is, is not just something that law enforcement agencies can do. Um, that we do need laws in place, they need to be implemented and enforced, and we need to have institutional support structures around them, like training law enforcement officials or police force on child protection, but also questions about the civil registration system so that births and marriages are registered. But that isn't enough, and unfortunately many people stop there. The other things that we, we need to see is we need to see that there are services available to girls. They need the right services to avoid marriage and be safe and empowered, as well as ensuring married girls have access to services that they need. This includes access to a high quality education, sexual and reproductive health care and comprehensive sexuality education, strong child protection systems, and financial services like bank accounts so girls can save in a safe way. So drilling down, we then get to, to, to some of the more um, social norms changes. We need to mobilize families and communities. This is really about the work done at the community level with key actors and gatekeepers who rarely allow girls to be the decision makers in their own lives. We know that in many communities, child marriage is a deeply rooted practice, and it takes time to change attitudes and behavior. So we have to work with key people like parents, grandparents, religious leaders, traditional leaders, teachers. So there are a number of ways that this can, there's community engagement, conversations, working shift social norms, um, community conversations, street theater, etc. So it's really about raising awareness of the harmful impacts of child marriage and helping that environment that the girls are in um, really support their choices. But finally, and this is really at the center, we need to empower girls themselves. This means building their capacity to claim their rights. So this could be equipping them with the training skills or information or support networks that they need to thrive. So it could be things like girls clubs, safe space programs, or economic empowerment savings group. We really want to make sure that girls know their rights, that they have the opportunity to gain information and skills and feel confident using these skills. And one of the things that's really interesting here is there's some emerging evidence that this is really one of the critical aspects that tends to be missing in interventions. And when it is missing, you don't see the kind of long-term impact that you want. So what does this look like at the community level? So I'm going to profile a couple of our members in each of these areas. So in terms of empowering girls, one of our members is the Kikenya Center for Excellence in Kenya. They seek to empower and motivate young girls through education to become agents of change and to break destructive practice, not only of child marriage, but female genital mutilation, which is connected in Kenya to um, early marriage. Uh, they, run primer, they run primary boarding schools for Maasai girls. In looking at mobilizing families and communities, there's some really interesting work being done by an organization called Blue Veins in Pakistan, which they engage civil society organizations, media, lawyers, religious leaders, and especially men and boys in communities to create zero tolerance for child marriage. They also lobby and engage policymakers and legislatures. In Guatemala, a population council is working to reduce the prevalence of child marriage in a holistic way by both encouraging girls to stay in school, the girls' empowerment, 
but also providing them with information on sexual and reproductive rights and access to the community services that are available to them. Young mentors run and facilitate programs discussing sensitive issues and how to access those services. In Morocco, Foundation Ito, which is a Moroccan women's rights organization, can, they conduct an annual campaign to end child marriage. So they travel from village to village, knocking on doors and talking to families about the rights that women and girls are legally entitled to, which is the approach within the community empowerment. But on this caravan, they also provide health care and legal services, so looking at the services. And, but interestingly, they then also gather data on the prevalence of child marriage in rural areas, which is not really available in Morocco, to support advocacy work pushing for implementation of family codes and laws around married girls. So they're a really good um, example of uh, an organization that has multiple interventions within the different strategies. So as, um, as was mentioned earlier, Girls Not Brides is a civil society partnership. We've got over 600 organizations from over 80 countries around the world. And uh, it's important to note that our members come from a real diversity of approaches that met most of them, in fact, are not child marriage organizations. They come from education, health, human rights, girls empowerment. Uh, interest <coughs> interestingly as well, um, we're, we're only 7% international NGOs and 20% of our members work exclusively at the community level. So this really is a bottom-up partnership. Um, it's because we know that community level engagement is really important to change child marriage as a social norm. So looking at what's happened so far, since 2011 there's been a huge recognition of child marriage at the global level. There are uh, resolutions that have been passed in the UN Human Rights Council and UN General Assembly uh, with the uh, push of our member organizations that lay out what countries need to do, but really importantly set a global norm that this is no longer uh, acceptable. And really importantly, in the new Global Development Goals, Target 5.3, under the Gender Equality Goal, there's actually a target that every country on Earth has now committed to end child early and forced marriage by 2030. Um, we've also seen significantly in, increased funding, but it really hasn't been enough to, to meet the scope of the problem, and there's, there's just really not enough going to grassroots organizations. At the regional level, we're seeing really important developments as well. The African Union has embedded um, child marriage and other harmful practices in Agenda 2063, their 50-year vision, and then launched a campaign to accelerate the end of child marriage by um, having country-by-country country launch campaigns on child marriage. In the Southern African Development Community, SADC, um, they've developed a model law for their members on how child marriage can be addressed at the, the legal level, but importantly, that model law doesn't just look at the legal changes, but the whole range of government services and interventions as well. Uh, we've also seen action in Asia at the regional level. The South Asia Association for Regional Cooperation adopted a regional action plan to end child marriage that officially recognizes child marriage as a human rights violation and lays out um, steps that, that member states need to take. Um, where, 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 we're, where we're seeing really exciting change now, however, is taking these big global and regional commitments and translating them into national strategies and nationwide initiatives to address child marriage. Um, we have seen national strategies to address child marriage um, launched in a number of countries uh, across uh, around the world. And while they are very much in the very early stages of um, implementation, these initiatives have mobilized public support and interest in the issue and outlined the need for multi-sectoral work, both to prevent child marriage and respond to the consequences of child marriage. Um, Girls Not Brides has developed a checklist and analysis of um, national strategies, and the checklist is there for organizations in country who want to work with their governments or even those developing these strategies in government to understand how best to um, develop these strategies, not only in terms of the content, but also the process, the inclusion of civil society in the affected communities, but also what needs to happen in terms of implementation, and that's available on our website. So looking forward, what do we need to see? We need to make sure that civil society organizations 
are seen as by all the actors from international organizations, development partners, governments, as really critical partners in ending child marriage. Civil society organizations have a really unique role on this issue as a social change issue because they are at the forefront of actually understanding from the community level what the local drivers are, what the local challenges are, and what it's going to take to move communities. And so we need to see the political leadership from governments in actually working actively with civil society organizations. We need to also see governments taking responsibility for effectively implementing Target 5.3. While we have um, an agenda and a commitment, this doesn't mean anything if governments do not actually actively implement it. And civil society has a role to play here in, in, in holding governments accountable. And finally, we need to really get at these root causes of child early and forced marriage. It's not enough to simply um, here and there have an intervention that looks at one of the drivers, but all interventions need to, to incorporate tackling wider gender inequalities to shift the social norms that perpetuate child marriage. So that is the, the presentation. I'd love to welcome questions and I'm just going to leave up a list of resources that I can circulate to you afterwards as well that we have that are available for people who want to be involved in in the child marriage work. Thank you so much Heather for that presentation. I would like to open the floor to questions and answers or any comments from our folks on the webinar session and um, our attendees here at the Commonwealth of Learning. We invite you to make any comments by unmuting your line, and you can do that by pressing on the red button that appears on your screen on GoToMeeting, or you can type in the chat box, and we can address those questions in a queue. Heather, can you see the, the, the comments in the chat box? People are commenting your presentation. Oh, yes. Thank you. I was just answering one of the questions there, a private question. I'd like to ask how to deal with post-CEFN situation. Um, I assume that means once a girl is married. Um, so I think that that is one of the things the, the, that we're actively looking at and trying to understand better. Um, obviously, married girls need um, access to services from, from governments and localities. For example, they need access to contraception so that uh, they can have control over um, when and if they have children. Um, and to avoid pregnancy when their bodies aren't ready. Um, in many places, married girls are not allowed to attend school. Um, there are actually laws against married girls attending school, so those laws need to be changed, and they need to be given access to schooling. Um, and there's also there's a, um, a, a community-based change question around this, which is sometimes it's not laws that's prohibiting them, but, but custom, that their families or their communities say, okay, you're married now, your job is in the home, and they need to understand that they need to have that kind of access. Um, they also need access to legal remedies. Um, where child marriage is illegal and they want to leave the marriage, they need to have the capacity to get divorced. So there are some legal conundrums and issues around when, um, if they aren't officially married under law, they can't officially get divorced and therefore they don't have access to the services that can support women who are trying to get out of, say, a, a violent situation in the home. And they need somewhere to go. So if their families reject them, we need to f ensure that girls who are married, who want to leave those marriages, have a safe space to go to. So those are just a few of the kinds of interventions we know are needed, but we actually have some internal work going in the partnership to try and identify a broader range of activities that need to occur for these girls. Okay. Thank you, Heather. 
Um, Sabine, I see that you've typed in some comments providing context to your question. Does that answer your question? You can click on the green, on the red button on your screen to speak. Okay, perfect. Hi, Hello. Go ahead. Yes, hello. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's it's a great uh, presentation. Uh, I must say, it's uh, it's it gives a global overview about the uh, uh, child marriage issue. Uh, I, I just like to say that we are ha we are uh, experiencing some of the cases where girls uh, who are married uh, between the before the age of 18 are now facing um, uh, post marriage issues like divorce and. Um, clash or conflicts with the husband and uh, uh, in-laws and now they have no place to go as the parents and um, uh, and uh, keeping in view the uh, socio-economic situation of of, the, of those girls um, and uh, as a as a civil society organization uh, sometimes we have no option to um, I mean least options to help them out uh, as our mandates are sometimes very limited and we can't provide them shelter though we can refer them refer them to some uh, uh, shelters uh, or protection um, houses run by the government um, but still um, uh, the issue is very complex so a uh, presentation like this gives us some more guidance and and provides some more ways to deal with the issues it's, it's the recent case which we um, experienced that one of our uh, one of the girls who visited our center previously and uh, our, my, my colleague Sajda just met her today and uh, she shared with her that she tried to uh, she tried to take her own life and she attempted six suicide uh, uh, suicide attempts recently because of the divorce and she's so young she can't handle all the social pressure and uh, family and relatives or uh, maybe all the people around they, they can't understand the trauma she's facing so all we can provide her some kind of counseling and um, a redirection or uh, uh, putting her to some kind of education or whatever we can do but um, it's just for the sharing purpose and uh, maybe um, Heather can uh, guide us more in that way because she has an extensive experience. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> Maybe I'm taking more time. Oh no, I, I, I would very much like to to, to respond to that because there were several things that you said which I think are really really critical. Um, you mentioned the socioeconomic situation. One of the the other kinds of services that needs to be there for married girls is. Um, the, those economic empowerment opportunities, the opportunities that if, if they're not returning to school, um, they may be too old by that point. Um, and if, or if there's no access to school, they need alternative economic opportunities. And I'm, I'm really sorry to hear about the girl who visited your center. And, and what's, what's really unfortunate and scary is that until, uh, I think it was last year or the year before, the leading cause of death for adolescent girls in the developing world was uh, maternal mortality. That's not true anymore. The leading cause of death for girls, adolescent girls in the developing world is now suicide. And um, there's a good Lancet article um, by Suzanne Petroni which makes the connections between child marriage and the disempowerment of girls and that, that increase in suicide. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention is that in many countries there are child lines, uh, child help lines um, that children can call to, to, to get assistance. So that, that might be something to look into. I know that within SIVAC, which is the South Asian um, apex body of SARC that is looking at child marriage, that they are working directly with national human rights institutions and child help lines to ensure that there are responses for girls who are either going to be married or who um, who are trying to leave a marriage. Thank you so much, Sabine and Heather. And thank you, Sabine, for sharing that story um, and Heather for those resources. Um, and we just wanted to uh, say, actually, that Sabine is speaking from this um, Society for the Protection of the Rights of the Child in Pakistan. For all of our girls and fire partners, you, you know that. But for the context of the people joining us in the room today, we just wanted to say that. 
Um, we have a couple of questions that are coming on the screen. So we have one from Mohammed Rifwan, who is the executive director of Shijulai um, in Bangladesh. And we have a question here in the room. And we'll proceed with a question from Shariar in Bangladesh. So um, Rizwan, would you like to unmute your phone and let us know what your question is? Uh, hi, um, thank you for the presentation. And I'd like to know um, uh, why you decided to become a separate organization in 2012. It's a follow-up question that I, that I asked uh, sure. uh, okay. before. And uh, also the second one is who started your organization? Mm -hmm. And uh, also uh, I would appreciate if you would share uh, more information on the work of foundation YTTO that you uh, mentioned in your presentation. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so as I mentioned, um, Girls Not Brides is a partnership um, was started by the elders. This is Nelson Mandela's group uh, and includes um, a number of very prominent individuals, but it's really Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Mrs. Grash Michelle, um, Nelson Mandela's widow, who, who were the the initial push behind this. And because they were looking for a way to address that intersection of tradition, religion, and the, and the oppression of women, um, and the consultations that they did, what they heard from people working on child marriage once they decided that child marriage uh, was what they wanted to work on, was that what they needed was not only the kind of work that the elders actually does, which is the very high level um, interventions of, of these very prominent people, but they needed a network. They needed a partnership, that they needed to work and learn together and coordinate action. And that was not something that the elders was the best position to do. So um, instead, it, instead of just being a project of this organization, which is very elite and high level, the decision was made to split off Girls Not Brides and to create a separate secretariat that could fundraise separately and really service the needs of our members separately. So that's how we became a separate organization. So we're a registered charity in the United Kingdom, but um, we really are a secretariat that serves the needs of our members and not kind of a separate organization with our own agenda. Um, and then you asked about Foundation Ito. I think we actually have a case study on, on their work, so let me, um, it would be good if uh, the organizers can share your email address and I'll check with um, my team and see if, if we have anything more on them that I can share with you. I'm not intimately familiar with their work, um, but we're, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we have more information on what they're doing. We actually just did a learning exchange where uh, one of our members from another country, I think Chad, actually went and participated on this caravan um, and then took the learning back to his own organization. And so I'm pretty sure that we actually can share something of, of what he found as well. Thank you very much, Heather and Rezwan. Um, Heather will be sure to share Rezwan's contact details with you and connect the both of you. Um, now I'd like to proceed to the next question. We have Ms. Um, Professor Dr. Sanjaya Mishra, who's the education specialist here at the Commonwealth of Learning for Ewan. Uh, thank you, Rita, for the presentation. I think it, uh, it's coming in the morning. It's worth time spent for me. It's a new area, and uh, and it's, it's good to learn um, the kind of work that you are doing and the issue that my colleagues here are uh, attending to um, at large. Uh, my question could be naive because I'm I'm not very much involved in it, but I know from uh, some of the countries that they have uh, legislative provision uh, about legal age of marriage. Uh, I'm trying to understand that uh, how this uh, legal provision, uh, legislative provision for marriage age, um, is uh, prevalent across the uh, countries in the world. And is there any difference in those countries which have a legal provision uh, for specific ways to get married and countries where there is no legal provision? Uh, do you see the difference uh, in the problem in these two countries? Or uh, there are other uh, issues to implement uh, legal uh, structures? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very good question um, because it's, it's a little bit of a complicated issue. So in countries that have a minimum age of marriage um, that has been longstanding and not enforced and they don't have the birth and marriage registration systems to enforce it, the judiciary ignores it, communities ignore it, um, it the legal age of marriage is, is actually not the way that we're going to see change. So telling people that it's illegal or raising awareness that it's illegal is not an effective response um, in, in those situations um, because the law in the absence of all of the other interventions is, is just not enough and particularly if it's not being enforced. And while there is some evidence that legal changes do not lead to decreases in rates of child marriage. There's also some, some good anecdotal evidence that efforts to change the age of marriage actually lead to broader, more comprehensive, multi-sectoral approaches to end child marriage and community awareness raising. So a number of our member organizations have worked to change their national laws to bring them in alignment with the Convention on the Rights of the Child and other mechanisms that the legal age of marriage should be at least 18, um, which is the partnerships position that was adopted at the very beginning, that, that there should be a legal age of 18. Um, but it's not something that uh, most people feel should be the focus of the work because it's not the linchpin change agent. So sometimes it can be a very effective way of rallying around the issue and, and sparking a conversation about broader interventions that are needed um, or of raising awareness of the need to address the issue. But simply changing the law alone is never enough. I hope that answers your question. Oh, yeah. Great. Thank you, Sanjaya, and thank you, Heather. Um, we're now uh, nearing the close of the hour, so we have um, time for a couple more questions. We see that there's a question for, from Shariar Alam from the Center for Mass Education and Science in Bangladesh asking about um, an explanation for target 5.3 of the SDGs. Um, Shariar, I'm not sure if you'd like to unmute your phone and um, provide more context to that question for Heather. Hello. 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 Go ahead. Hello. 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 Uh, can you please? Hello. Hi. Hi, Shariar. Please go ahead. You can hear me. Okay. Uh, can you please explain uh, the target 5.3 within the Sustainable Development Goal or the uh, 2030? Sure. Um, so, as as you're likely aware, um, last year the world committed to a set of global goals that everybody, every country, this is not just developing countries, will commit to achieving by 2030. Um, there are 16 of these goals, and the fifth goal is that we will work to achieve gender equality. Um, one of the targets under that goal, the third one, target 5.3, um, commits to ending all harmful traditional practices, including child early enforced marriage and female gen genital mutilation, by 2030. Now, what's really important is not just that there is a commitment to the issue for the first time at this broad global level, um, but that governments are actually accountable for progress on these goals. They actually have to report within the system of the Sustainable Development Goals to the high-level um, high panel on what their progress is. And so not only do they need to align their national efforts to achieving this goal, but they then have to report on how they did every year. So it's a new accountability mechanism. It's a new way of saying not only that the issue is really important, but the governments have an obligation. And for people at the national level, being able to point to the Human Rights Council resolutions, the UN General Assembly resolution, the regional instruments, and particularly this commitment in the global goals, these can be important ways to go to your government and say, you made these commitments. These are your global commitments. You said you would do it. What are you going to do? I think that's great. Thanks so much, Heather and Shariar, for asking that question. That puts into context um, the international commitment that we're all aiming towards. Now I'd like to proceed to the next question from Dr. Bala here, who is the Vice President of the Commonwealth of Learning in the Room. Hi, Heather, and hi, friends. 
This is Bala here. Hello. Hi, uh, Heather. That was a very good presentation. Very interesting. Uh, you know, I just uh, mine is not a question, but it's uh, some suggestions and some points and some very interesting uh, uh, new insights which are coming in in this area. Uh, the, first of all, I want I wanted to check how far the demographers and population researchers are involved in your program. The which researchers? Demographers and the population research, uh, the population research experts. You know, because since to 1960, I have come across age at marriage is a very important uh, area of study in the population research. Uh, are they involved in your programs? Um, we don't at the Secretariat work directly with demographers and population research experts, but I do know that they're involved um, at the global level on helping to identify. By, um, what are some of the indicators that, for example, the UN Global Program, there's a joint program between UNFPA, how are they measuring this? And there are efforts to improve data collection around um, issues related to child marriage. So UNICEF in the uh, DHS and mix surveys, their surveys that they do with um, national governments, collects information on um, the way it's structured is that it's, it's the percentage of girls between the ages of 20 and 24 who were married before the age of 18. And the reason they collect it that way is that that offers a snapshot of the prevalence rate for that given um, population, whereas if you just measure the number of girls under the age of 18 married, you could miss a girl who is currently 16 and gets married before 18. Um, but there's a lot of other population data that's needed. Um, so was the girl pregnant before she got married? Did she, How long was it after she got married? Did she become pregnant? Um, it, did she have to drop out of school? So, so there, there, there's a, there are actually efforts to improve data collection. I know the Gates Foundation is very interested in this and just launched a big, big campaign as well around these issues of child marriage. Thank you, Heather. And there are two points which we found out in one of our studies that thought it would be of use to you. Uh, because we have been talking about women's empowerment as a very crucial for this, uh, particularly the economic empowerment. Uh, but a recent study by International Fund for Agriculture Development, IFAD, shows that the fact that a, a woman is empowered economically does not mean that she is empowered at the household level. Mm -hmm. is that there is a very crucial difference and they have come up with some, with some interesting statistics about it. And we also came across a very interesting study in Tanzania some time back that the disempowerment of men is a very important reason for the domestic violence and the status of women at the household level. So the study suggests that there is a need to empower men so that the the, at the household level, the decision-making process, uh, you know, particularly the decisions regarding the life cycle decisions that could improve. It's, they also suggest that if you have to address these problems, you also have to address the men. Yes. And uh, how far your program is focusing on this area? Um, so because we don't uh, run direct programming but, but support the work of our members, we have some case studies around work with men and boys, but that's another one of the areas that we're actually um, looking at potentially setting up a community practice around in the coming years. Um, I know that my team is really excited to learn from you, from the Commonwealth of Learning, about how you do your community of practice, because we're just moving into that area. Um, one of the organizations that I mentioned um, the Blue Veins actually has been doing some really exciting work around men and boys. Um, but I don't know that we have a whole lot of information about that programming. What I can do is is look that up for you and send that over to you. If you could just, again, I don't, I don't have the email address for everyone, so if we could capture the request for further information, and then I can follow up afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather and Bella. Um, now we have the next question. We've got time for one more question and coming in to the closing remarks. Um, we see a question coming in from Anika, who is from the Center of Math Education and Science in Bangladesh. Um, she's asking, do you have any research or papers to study on um, child early or forced marriage or any statistical documentation on the issue? 
if you have any, could you please share this with us? Yes, indeed, there's a whole lot. I just realized that I was um, uh, answering in the chat box, but sending it only to Muhammad. So apologies. <laughs> I wanted to say thank you to everyone for all the positive feedback. I really appreciate. It. I'm glad this is useful. And then on the um, on the studies, we have actually a resource center on our website that has an, a, a, quite a few f uh, um, practical resources on child marriage, um, so toolkits, program development information, etc. And then we also have a reports and studies page on the website, which is a comprehensive set of every study that we can find on child marriage. Um, and in the Resource Center and in other places, you will find some of that overall statistical information. The best, one to, the best ones to look for are the, are the resources done by UNICEF, because the best data is coming out of UNICEF. So there's a couple things from UNICEF on the site. But again, if anyone has very specific needs, I'm happy to have my team follow up and see what we have in terms of resources. But do know that those two sections of our website, we try to actually have that really comprehensive. If there's anything out there that has been published on child marriage, either as a resource or a study, it goes up on that site. And they're searchable by keywords, re regions, languages. There's quite a few materials in French. Um, so that's all available on the site. Thank you very much, Heather. And um, as a follow-up to this webinar, we will be sharing the recording of the webinar and also a link to the, your website for Girls Not Brides and the resources that you posted as well during your presentation. And we'll be, make, we'll be sure to connect you with the people that um, had follow-up questions and resources um, that were raised during the presentation. Now, I'd just like to go, just because we've, we're coming to the hour, um, there's one more question from Safir from Badari in Pakistan, and then we'll go to the closing remarks. Um, Safir, would you like to unmute your phone and ask the question? Hello. Hi, go ahead, Sophia. We can hear you. Yeah, well, uh, my question was not for uh, Heather. Actually, this uh, other gentleman who was um, speaking, I forgot his name. Uh, he, he mentioned disempowerment of men and said that empowering men would help. So that was uh, something new for me, and I wanted to know a little more about that. Yeah, it was. So what exactly? Yeah, it was a study where done in Tanzania somewhere in 2011. Maybe I will pass it, but I know I will send you the URL of that study. You could have a look at it. It's a very interesting study. That, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Dr. Bala. Um, what we are going to do also after this webinar is we'll create a discussion on the Girls um, Inspire community of practice, and we'll start that discussion I see that there are some comments coming in here, and we can take that discussion over to that post-discussion webinar on the Girls Inspire Community of Practice, and we'll send that link around as well to continue to the, um, the conversation. Um, without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to Mrs. Frances Ferreira here at the Commonwealth of Learning for the closing remarks. <clears throat> thank you very much, much uh, Cherise. First of all, let me thank you for facilitating the session. You've done a great job. Uh, thank you very much to all of you who have signed in from wherever you are uh, and also to our um, is it fans here at the Commonwealth of Learning of our team that supported us by being here in the room with us today uh, because without you we couldn't have had this webinar and most importantly thank you to Heather for having made this time to speak to um, our partners, to give us more information. Um, indeed, you have done a great job so far as Girls Not Brides, and uh, this is really a wonderful resource. Girls Not Brides is a wonderful resource to all of us, uh, whether it is about reports, whether it's about advice. Uh, this is a place we can go and get more information. I'm indeed very happy that you have agreed to speak to us today um, and I see this as a first in a series of webinars that we can arrange in future to make follow-ups and zoom into a specific issue in this regard as it uh, go along. Uh, so thank you very much everybody. I have asked Cherise to put on the screen right now for all of you to see the 
website of Girls Not Brides. There were questions about reports, etc., and Heather has responded to it. Uh, but that is the link that we have sent earlier, showed you earlier. But here is the website. Um, go there and find all the information that you need and more. But also, we will, as Cherise has said, we will uh, continue the discussion on our community of practice. We will give you the links there again, and we also will give share the study that Dr. Bala uh, was talking about and Safir was asking about. We will also put that link. Um, so this is what it's all about. For us to have a better understanding of the work that we are doing so that we can make that difference in regard to uh, ending this cycle of child early forced marriages. So if we don't have all the information, we cannot go in there confident and talk about these issues. And that is why it's so important that we read about this, that we empower ourselves in this regard. So um, with that, I want to thank you all once again and remind you of the fact that we will put the recording also on the community of practice, the link. We will send it to all of you. Um, but finally, you are all welcome to become members of Girls Not Brides. If you visit their website, you will also see how to become a member, and that will also uh, make you stronger uh, as the individual organization being a partner of call, but also a partner of Girls Not Bright. Uh, with that, let me thank you once again. If there's any person who has the last word, uh, now is the time because we are just one minute over the hour. Thank you very much. Thank you. If there's nobody, then we say bye. And we see Kuntal has just joined us at the end of the session from Sri Lanka. Kuntal, we will put the recording there for you to follow us and to follow up on what was said. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.